Amen. Amen. So it was a month or so ago, and Brooke, my wife, and I were having uh, our two friends, Chris and Michelle, Michelle James, over to our house for dinner. Um, Chris and Michelle have been friends of ours for years. They um, are part of our young adult ministry for years, pretty much as I've known them since college. Um, but Chris was heading uh, to Harvard uh, in the coming months. My boy is wicked smart. I might, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be doing that every time I mention he's going to Harvard, but uh, they, were, uh, they were coming over to our house for dinner for, for a long time. We've shared this like mutual uh, love of cuisine and food, especially Italian food, because they had spent a couple months in Italy during, in college. Brooke and I went on our honeymoon to Italy, and so we even have a group text, an Italian food group text, and so uh, anyway, Brooke thought, what a great opportunity. Before they move off to Boston, we'll have them over one last time and go all out. We'll open a bottle of wine from our honeymoon in, in Italy, and, 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 and Brooke is an incredible cook. If, you, if you've ever tasted any of her food or baking, it's just out of this world. And so Brooke is like, I am going to go all out this time. I'm going to make homemade meatballs, and her meatballs are incredible. And so she, the day before they come, she's spending hours and hours in the kitchen chopping up uh, whole, you know, handfuls of, of garlic, and, and, uh, and she's mincing that, and she's chopping up parsley, and she's shredding Parmesan, and she's forming meatballs, you know, out of the pork and the beef, and I'm in the living room watching football, probably, the entire time, and she is slaving away, and so she bakes them, she cooks them up, she puts them in a Ziploc bag, and then she puts them in the freezer for the next day so we can uh, defrost them and make the whole rest of the, the meal that she had planned. We go to bed, we wake up the next morning, we spend time with God, and then we pretty normally just blitz off to work because we cut it real close. And so we run out of the house, um, and when I'm about a couple blocks away from here, um, Brooke calls me, she says, babe, I totally forgot to take the meatballs out of the freezer and they need to defrost. Can you take them out of the freezer and put them into the fridge so they can start defrosting for tonight? Um, I responded angrily uh, inside my heart because I'm like, Babe, I'm almost to work. You always, you forgot that you, I cannot believe you're going to make me do this. And I feel like I have to say yes. And so this is going through my head. And I, so I say, yeah, fine, I'll do it. I go home, you know, I run through the door. I go to the freezer. I take out the bag of meatballs. And I do what I've done innumerable times since college with frozen food. I want to eat that night. I set it on the counter and I go to work. Again, yeah, some of you already know this. I did not... I didn't know this. So I, I go to work. We come back later. Um, I'm at the house, and she comes home a couple hours later, and she walks in, and she sees the meatballs on the countertop. And she says, TJ, how long have these been out on, on the countertop? I very proudly go, I don't know, five, eight hours, nine hours? I mean, as long as we've been at work. And then she just falls apart. <laughs> Tears and tears and tears because she put so much hard work into this because she wanted to show Chris and Michelle how much she loved them and how much she cared for them. And I felt awful. I felt so guilty. I'm like, I watched her slave away. I know, if, it, like, Brooke cares about people more than anyone has ever cared about anybody. And so she, I'm like, she, she is crushed. So through tears and a healthy first year of marriage conversation, um, and hearing it a couple of times because the story has been passed around. I've since learned my lesson. Uh, we, we got past that and we had a wonderful Italian dinner afterwards. But while this story is funny and humorous because we blaze right past it, we all know that we each have much more painful stories from our past of things we've done wrong, things we've in anger or malice from a broken heart, made a decision or a choice that truly hurt someone we love. Truly created a, an opportunity that was a lot longer taking to heal. Maybe even to this day, we're still working through that. But none of us are alone in that. And none of us come to the realization of how to grow from that without first seeing the decisions we've made, the things we've said, acknowledging them, and then admitting our faults. That is our first step to seeing change. Last week, Jaden uh, started off a series for us entitled The Way, uh, the Way of Repentance, 
and he talked about repentance. He, he had this um, way of saying it for, for us today and, and, and last week that we were going to talk a little bit last week about repentance in the macro and then today um, uh, the micro. And a bit of what he said was like that, that we need to see the fruit of repentance and I believe that today um, we'll see a bit of that through confession. I actually want to go back to Jaden's story from last week in Matthew chapter 3 um, to kind of pick up where we're starting today, to kind of set the groundwork for where we're going. And so if you have your Bible, take it out. It'll also be behind me. But it's Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And it says this. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So John, preparing the way or the path of Jesus, was calling for all of us and them to repent. Maybe a better translation for that word would be the word convert. And, and not conversion from one religion to another. No, more so this idea of a conversion of one's own life. I know when we hear the word repent, we think of this idea of it's a turning, right? It's a turning and a walking the opposite way. But when we hear the word convert, we think of something different entirely. Because what we're saying in conversion, this word convert is you become a completely different thing, right? You are a completely different person. You're not the same person doing something different. You are a new, as the New Testament would call it, creation. So he says, convert, convert. And how does he say for us to convert? He says, confess and be washed. See, men and women from all around Judea hear about this man, John, calling Jews to confess their sins and be baptized because the day of the Lord's coming is near. And it's not that these people hadn't been told to live lives and uh, good lives and follow the law from the great lawgiver Moses and their priests, but there was something different about this man, John. He didn't dress like the Jewish synagogue rulers or teachers of the law. His cloth tassels mandated by the law weren't hanging from beautiful dyed garments made by prominent weavers in Jerusalem, his hung from uh, crusted camel fur. He didn't spend his time debating the law, reclined at tables of princes and governors. He ate what he could find, if he could find it. Maybe most of all, he didn't talk like them. His words didn't sound like one trying to convince with haughty words or lectures that sound like he believed it in his mind but wasn't so convinced in his heart, he sounded like a man who had talked with God, the one of a voice calling in the wilderness. See, I know, as strange as it might seem to us in the modern day, uh, that Jews might confess. Confession actually wasn't a new thing for Jews. Uh, in their law, in Levit Leviticus 5, 5 through 6, God says, when a man realizes his guilt in any of these sins and confesses the sin he's committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he's committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. So when God's dictating his law to his people, he says, admit to your faults. Go to the priest." Admit to the priest your faults. Bring your sacrifice and let its blood wash over your sin. Because blood must be spilled. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 6, Nehemiah says, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, speaking to God, to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. 
confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. He even confesses and lays the example for one's confession of the sins of his own nation, of his own family, including himself. In other places, the word confession isn't used, but it's clearly implied in maybe some of our favorite uh, scriptures in the Bible in the Psalms, right? David continuously to God and man in what seems to be at one point a private journal and in others uh, a song book to be sent off to the, the Levites to sing worship, he puts out his sins before everyone. He admits his faults before God and confesses. He launders them out for all of us to see. In Psalm 52, 1 through 4, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. He saw his sin. He claimed his failures. And I think that there's something interesting about David that I think we love these psalms so much because David puts to words our own feelings, our own brokenness, in ways that maybe we have trouble expressing. So we're drawn to his confessions to even live our lives. And as normal as the idea of confession might be to these Jews that are hearing John in the wilderness, something is shockingly different from the people going out and coming in from his baptisms. So many people before, they had seen go up to Jerusalem once a year, to atone for their sins, bringing a goat, saying what they've done wrong, coming back to the exact same people. For maybe the first time, the people in nearby villages see friends, neighbors, family members sauntering out of the rocky wilderness, floating like the desert breeze. They told of a man calling them to give up their old selves, to convert their lives and announce to God and man their many sins, and now they were free. Now they're paving the way of repentance through the desert, back to Jerusalem, making it ready for the king to come. Who could say no? Who couldn't go out? What was this thing, though, that was so heavy upon them that when it's once gone, they're just floating? I think we all know that it's sin. See, I know that in the Bible Belt, sin is something that we all kind of take for granted for understanding what it is, but I really do wonder, do we know why sin is sin? Have we ever really dived into that? Often it's easier for us to think of the Ten Commandments hanging on a wall, and we just say, hey, as long, if, if I go out of these things, outside of the bounds of these, um, I should feel bad. I should do better next time to not make the same decision. And that is my understanding. But sin is much, much more destructive than that. Think of the pain that comes with sin. Divorce or the damage caused by a lie used to hide dark truths over and over again. The panic that someone might stumble onto something in your search history. The crushing fear caused by being found out for who we really are. The inability to truly be with others. And most of all, God, because we know what we've done. Think of the thing that weighs you down. Entices your anxieties. Brings about fear, loneliness, doubt, hatred. That isn't first shackled to a sin in our lives. What if sin isn't defined by crossing a line you shouldn't cross? But what if God, knowing what leads us to death and destruction, calls those things sin? Matthew Henry said, sin is a debt, a burden, a thief, a sickness, a leprosy, a plague, a poison, a serpent, a sting. Everything that hurts man, sin is. J.C. Ryle in his book, Holiness, said, sin is the abominable thing that God hates. Sin is the only thing that God hasn't made. 
Sin is the only thing that makes the bright world look dark. Sin is the only thing that wearies the soul and breaks its peace. Sin wearies our soul and darkens our lives. What we find in God's call to a way of repentance is a path of righteousness and life, a narrow way of light cut through a world of utter darkness. Jesus cries out to us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, we actually haven't changed very much from our forefather and mother, Adam and Eve. Sin is something we are drawn to. Uh, We believe This consistent theme of God is constantly withholding something from me. And I have to, if I want it, I have to get it from myself. I'm going to have to do what God won't do for me. And when the searing pain of that choice pulls down on our shoulders, we do what they did. We run, we hide, we conceal. It's easier for us to lie than to bring our shame into the light. It's hard because we know that we'll have to shatter the facade of the carefully constructed and cultivated image of ourselves that we've sold to our community and to our friends and to our family. And honestly, we might rather feel the deep and searing pain of the shame and sin in our life and just hope that it motivates us to be better next time, to do better next time, though we know deep down that that feels way too big a task for us to handle. Every, uh, every time I get together with my guys in discipleship, um, we have like a normal rhythm of how discipleship goes for us. We get together, we talk for a while, um, we, we spend about 10 to 15 minutes praying together, each of us, just closing our eyes, praying whatever God has on our hearts or whatever we feel like God's put before us. And when we finish praying, we confess. Every single time we get together, we take a moment to confess to one another the sins we've committed. And this isn't just so that we might be men without sin, but that we might be men without secrets. I was talking to a brother the other day, uh, and we were talking about confession. We were talking about uh, this deep moment of sorrow he had had and bringing his sin to light. And I was reminded and able to share with him that while it feels like there's this insurmountable pit that you're ever tumbling into with the sun, that you, in confession of your sin, took the largest leap forward towards healing and newness of life that he had known in years. This is consistent with confession for any and all of us. Without confession, sin is thickened around our soul with every act of transgression. But in confession, there's purification, a breaking away of darkness and coming into the light. If we don't confess our sins, I promise you, it doesn't remain idle. It is a cancer, hidden, buried, that grows and starts to touch every single part of our lives as long as we allow it. Confession's hard because it's having to admit someone all your faults and all of your defeats you have to admit. And in a way that that, that's true, but in another even truer sense, it's moving into victory. Sin is a place of failure. Confession is the place of perseverance and a place of not giving up. I think even we internalize quite often that if I'm a mature Christian, I shouldn't need to confess. As a mature Christian, I should have to confess less and less. I would posit the idea that that could not be further from the truth. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says, when a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. When a man's getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that's still left in him. That is to say, the holier we get, the more of us we see. And the more of us we see, the more we should confess. As we mature, we confess more and more. But 
I want to continue to say that there is hope for us in our fear, right? In this daunting nature of confession that we so feel. I recently, uh, walk, driving through campus, I drive through campus every day to get to work and every Sunday, obviously, to get here. Brooke and I live in the Garden District, so it's just the easiest jot over. And I'm sure a lot of you guys do, too. So you've probably seen recently, they are just redoing everything with the LSU Lakes, right? They've kind of um, started to not drain it, but allow it to drain, so it's drying up. They've got excavators in there that are, like, digging up um, things all over the place. They're going to, like, build a, a bigger interstate, praise God, uh, over the lakes. And they're going to be building these really cool parks and stuff. And I, I've spent a lot of time at the lakes, as I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, since college. You go on runs there or walks there. Not so much me. Brooke does. I, I just like to look at them, I think. Uh, and I know in college, we used to just hammock out there for hours when I was skipping all my classes, which again, bad decision. Don't ever do that if you're in college. Uh, but what's funny is I was driving by recently, and it's like every day it's progressing. Um, as it's drying up and the water is kind of receding, I, I'm seeing the strangest things stuck in the mud. Okay, I'm not alone. Good. I'm seeing, like, lawn chairs, signs. I, I'm watching, like, they're pulling so many golf balls out there. I'm like, maybe I should wander out there and steal some golf balls. Um, there's, like, mannequins, because it's on sorority row and touches some of the fraternity, so they're throwing anything out there. But what's crazy to me is, I know this, you know this, I think that's the most beautiful, the, the LSU Lakes are the most beautiful place in our entire city. I believe that pretty thoroughly. But as I'm seeing the water recede, I'm really shocked at how much lied beneath just apparently three feet of water, right? I thought it was deeper. I absolutely thought it was deeper. And, but it's crazy. When I'm realizing that these lakes that were so gorgeous, that we spent all our time out there running around and hanging out and taking in the ease of the day, was actually shallow and filled with junk. And how much I felt for us. When I was preparing the sermon, I'm like, oh my God, that's us. Like, that is us. That, that, that if only we in our lives would allow for others to see what's just beneath the surface and allow for there to be these excavators of our friends and our family here in the body of Christ to dig out these logs, these branches, these things that don't belong there. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Life Together said that in confession, the breakthrough to community takes place. Sin demands to have man by himself. It withdraws him from community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. He who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. God has given us confession to eliminate our loneliness and our aloneness. Confession, then, is a gift. And I know confession doesn't always feel like a gift, so I have to point that out. But in the Old Testament, when we sin, we take our guilt to the priest, and we bring along our goat to be killed for our restitution and our forgiveness. But it's different today. We don't have to make our restitution for our forgiveness to one man. We don't have to pay in goat's blood. We don't have to pay, as Peter says, in gold and silver. But instead, the blood of a Savior covers our sin forever. We need only ask for it. Confession is bringing our sin to Jesus, saying, I can't beat this, and he obliterates it. In Mark chapter 2, there's a story of Jesus and his disciples on the Sabbath day walking through a field of wheat with the Sadducees and the Pharisees in tow behind. And what they see is Jesus' Jesus' disciples, as he's walking and teaching, are picking heads of grain off of the wheat and eating it. This breaks Jewish Sabbath law um, because you're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. And, of course, as that gets whittled down to even more nitpicky laws— as they're picking these heads of wheat off, they are harvesting the grain. They are doing work. They're harvesting on the Sabbath. And they say, Jesus, 
This is the Sabbath. What are they doing? And Jesus says in verse 27 of chapter 2, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. You might wonder where I'm going with this. Uh, a couple years ago, I read that and my life changed, I feel like. A lot of um, the things that I considered these hobbies and tasks um, all my life, these things that I'm like, you should do them because God tells you to do them, like Sabbath, like fasting, like prayer, like worship, like confession. I had always felt that these things were things that I had to do. I was made to do them. But Jesus twists this and he says, no, no, no. I, you weren't made for confession. I made confession for you. Confession then becomes a gift from God for us. And if we could understand that, suddenly all of our mental structures of what confession is should fall down, be destroyed. And then we build them back up again to what God has truly called us to, that we might in this moment renew our minds, be converted to this new way of repentance. Confession for us is powerful. I think it's normal. I think it makes sense for us to say, like, does something actually happen when we confess? Or is it just like a mental exercise that we go through? Um, James answers this in James 5, 16. He said, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. I would venture to guess that we know this verse really well. Mainly the second half. We love to talk about that the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective, and they are. You can take that, and we can apply it to so many things. But I wonder how many of us knew that that was applied in this way towards confession, that, that, that James is making the point that there is healing work in confession to one another and in the prayers of a brother or sister. This word heal here is the Greek word ioma, which means to cure to make whole. He says, pray for one another that you may be cured and made whole. This is the same word used in the Gospels when Jesus heals the woman with the bleeding affliction, when he heals the centurion's servant, when coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, there's a little boy and his father, and the little boy has a demon that is causing what look like epileptic seizures. Jesus with this word, heals that boy and casts out that demon. He makes him whole. He cures him. That is to say that when we confess to one another, God heals in the same way we would see closed eyes open, lame feet walk. There is power in confession. Tertullian, the church father, said regarding confession, some flee from this work as being an exposure of themselves or they put it off day to day. I presume that they're more mindful of modesty than of salvation. Like those who contract a disease in the more shameful parts of the body and shun making, it, making themselves known to the physicians and thus they perish along with their own bashfulness. Amen. That is a deep word. When we lay down our pride of pretending we don't sin and we admit to God and one another we're not perfect, we humble ourselves and invite God to heal. We have the powerful healing prayers of our holy family flood into those dark places with the light of life. We shouldn't hold back um, these hidden things in our confessions uh, because, like an analogy like this, I guess, with, with a doctor. Could you imagine going to a doctor and saying, hey, doc, not doing great. I'm in serious pain. It's either physical or emotional. Um, it, it could be mental, but it hurts bad. Go ahead. He'd be like, what are you talking I need to know what you did to hurt this thing. I need to know what it is, where it's at, how you did it, right? Like, I need to know specifically what happened. If you want me to help you, if you want me to heal you, you can't just hide what happened. Real confessions never remain vague or general as any sickness in us shouldn't if we truly want to be healed. And this is a great moment to remind you that Jesus refers to himself as 
the great physician. In 1 John 1, 9, we're promised that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will heal any sin that we give to him. It's the sins that we hold from him that he won't heal. Confession is for us together. We confess to one another because in 1 Peter 2.9 it says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We no longer have to confess to just one person. We are called to be a holy priesthood, one to one another together, and we receive each other's confessions with mercy and grace. If we're trying to fight our sin alone, we're not going to find true healing. And if we don't confess our sins, we don't receive the blood of Jesus to cover it, but I promise you this, you will be using your own blood to cover your sins. And it won't work, and you will bleed out doing it on your own. Funny enough, in the early church, they were very clear about this. In the DDK, which is maybe one of the, one of the earliest texts we have from the early church, it was written in 70 AD, um, maybe by the apostles, we're not 100% sure. They say this, though, to the churches. Confess your sins in church, and don't go up to prayer or worship uh, with an evil conscience. This is the way of life. On the Lord's day, gather together, break bread, and give thanks after confessing your transgressions so that your sacrifice may be pure. All that we, as those receiving confession, can give to one another is the grace and mercy of Jesus and the loving friendship to console and encourage forward. Receiving someone's confession should put the fear of God in us because if not for the grace of God, we would just be in their seat. But there's this beautiful thing that because of his great mercy and love, both of our sins are forgiven in the work of confession. In doing, um, in doing the research for this sermon, um, I stumbled across a YouTube video by a Catholic priest uh, who, as you can imagine, there's tons of content out there from Catholics. If anything, we're seeing, I mean, if anybody that has a background in Catholicism, as I do with my family, uh, you know, confession is a massive part of day-to-day -day life for the Catholics, for, for our brothers and sisters. Um, we could do better to confess more, that's for sure. But they shared this story that marked me because of the point I'm making here and confessing to one another. He said, uh, it had been decades since I went to Mass, since I went to confession, and I was a mess. Every sin that I could stumble onto, I did. And one day, God opened my eyes, and I wanted to go to confession. I wanted to confess my sins. I didn't want to be who I was anymore. He said, I sat in the confessional. I told the priest for a good while what I'd done. And after a long time of confessing a decade worth of sins, everything I could remember, he said, say one Hail Mary. And he said, uh, <clears throat> That's it? Did you not hear all of the things I did? That's not even enough for one of the things I said. What are, you, what are you, that's it? And he said, yeah, and I'll be fasting for you for the next 30 days. And in that moment, I thought, I want to be like that. I want to be someone that when someone confesses to me, I want to be so quick to forgive. And I want to be so quick to say, can I link arms? How do I help? How do I help you in this journey? I don't want to just say, like, oh, I'll pray for you real quick. See you later. Hey, you're forgiven. See ya. But say, how, what can I do now and for the next five or six days, 30 days? How do I partner with you to see you heal? How can I hear and how can I help? That is how we receive confession. Um, I can have the band come on up. Uh, one thing I really wanted to point out here, we're actually going to have a moment. Don't, nobody run. We're going to have a moment to practice this. I almost like bar the doors. You don't, we don't need to do that. Um, 
But this is going to be a really awesome moment for us. Um, we often talk about this idea of revival as a church. Um, and I think that what we mean by that is we're saying we want to see believers come to life and we want to see non-believers come to Jesus, right? That is this idea of revival, big move of that. Um, and it's clear that our nation hungers for one. We saw what happened, Jaden referenced it last week, uh, with Asbury. Um, people, it was the biggest thing in the news, this, this Asbury revival, for weeks. It's clear there's a hunger for revival. And I want to say this. There is not, in my study, a single revival that has ever started with prayer or worship or a good sermon. They have all started with grand confession. If you, if you go back to the Moravians, who we love to talk about, they had a, like a 10-year prayer meeting, like a nonstop prayer meeting. And if you were to ask one of them, which had happened plenty of times, how did this whole thing start that went from a prayer meeting to a worldwide missions organization? They would all say, they pointed back to one night where they just started to confess their sins. They were free for the first time. And that's when the prayer meeting started, which is vital. I'm not saying prayer is not, it's vital. But it started with confession and then moved to prayer and then moved to missions around the world. If we want to see revival, if you want to see revival, confess your sins to one another that you might be healed. There is a voice in the wilderness saying, make the straight paths for the Lord. Make way for God. Confess your sins to one another and be healed. And so I want to, um, we're going to take like five minutes. We'll turn down the lights a little bit and just take a minute. And we've got, uh, I've got a quote up here that I'm going to use. as just kind of a prompt from Charles Spurgeon um, that is going to kind of guide us a bit into quieting ourselves and asking God, would you show me the way? Spurgeon said this, he said, just a quote, again, to guide us, we could say the same thing. Lord, help me to examine myself and cleanse me from all my secret faults. If I have made an idol of any sin, I pray the Spirit would reveal this to me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Just five minutes, close your eyes. Be alone for a second. And then I want to press you as much as I can. If there is something you're like, this is it. This is the, these are the shackles on me. Grab someone you came with. Share it with them. I know that's scary. I pray that something in this stuck out that you're like, no, but I should. I pray the Spirit of God is convicting all our hearts. Share it with someone. Maybe for the first time. Grab two people if you feel like I just, these two people, these are my people do it. And actually, if I could even have the prayer team, um, maybe in the back, if you didn't come with someone, if you're alone, you're like, I just want to talk to someone, anyone, right here in the back corner, we'll have a couple of people with our prayer team that would love to hear your confession and pray for you. Okay? Let's do this for five minutes.